COP26, the UN Climate Conference, takes place in just a few days' time. Today, we look at the expectations of COP from an international perspective. What do local communities want to achieve? How will they mitigate and adapt to the impact of climate change? And what decisions need to be made internationally to help this happen? I'm Rosie Oakes. Welcome to Mostly Climate. The Met Office do a lot of work internationally, and in this episode, we'll be hearing from three climate scientists from the Met Office working on partnered projects in Africa and Southeast Asia. Joining me is mostly climate co host and climate scientist here at the Met Office, Dr. Doug McNeil. Hi, Doug. Hi, Rosie. Before we hear from our guests, let's start with a quick FAQ. First one I'm going to start with, how many countries, and I know it's a lot, how many countries do the Met Office work with internationally? So the Met Office works with 150 countries outside of the UK, and this incorporates over 480 different institutions. So what kind of work do we do with international partners? Is it all research? Research is a big part of our international collaboration. Getting all the best science minds together from all over the world really helps us understand the global climate system. So where does the money come from to fund this work? The money comes from foreign aid money, so from the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office, or FCDO. When we think about foreign aid, at least for me, I think about when a disaster has happened, people send tents or medical supplies. But this money is to help nations prepare for climate change. So one area is called the Weather and Climate Science for Service Partnership Programme, WCSSP. And this programme supports the UN Sustainable Development Goal. So we work in partnership with people around the world, helping them to build up their MET services and understand the needs of the people in their countries. So right now that programme is running in Brazil, China, India, South Africa and Southeast Asia. And I know the UN Climate Conference COP26 is coming up really soon. So how does this tie in to COP26? The work that the Met Office is already doing means we have relationships and colleagues internationally. And this means that the Met Office is in a great position to help carry out the goals of COP. This is really what we're going to be talking about in the rest of the episode today. Can you just remind us, Doug, what the four main aims are of COP and what they mean? Well, the first is the mitigation of climate change, and really that means reducing greenhouse gas emissions in order to limit the amount of climate change that happens. The goal is to secure net zero carbon emissions by mid-century and keep 1.5 degrees within reach while keeping global mean temperatures well below 2 degrees. So that means ambitious emissions reductions, including phasing out coal, reducing deforestation and investing in renewables. Okay, so number one, decrease our emissions. What's next? Second, adaptation to ongoing climate change to protect communities and natural habitats. That means things like building physical barriers, resilient infrastructure and setting up warning systems to keep people safe. Sounds like some big changes are needed. Yep, and big changes cost money. So the third goal of COP is to mobilise finance. So the UK government think that to achieve the other goals, developed countries must mobilise at least $100 billion in climate finance a year. Whoa, (laughs) that's a lot of cash. So we're going to have some money to help us achieve the first two goals. And what is the last goal? Well, as we mentioned before, the fourth is work together to deliver. So this is a global challenge and we have to tackle it together through collaboration between society, governments and businesses. And I think there's just one more thing that we should talk about uh, in order to set up this episode, and that's climate risk and the elements of climate risk. Yeah, so this is something that we talk a lot about when we're working in climate science, but there are really three main components to climate risk. So the first one is the hazard itself. So this is the possible future occurrence of the natural or human induced physical events that could have a negative effect on people or materials or buildings. So the first component is just that physical hazard itself. So that might be a cyclone or a flood. And the second is the exposure. So this is the population, the crops, the buildings, the infrastructure or the economic resources located in the areas where a hazard might hit. So one way to reduce exposure to a climatic hazard is to avoid building in areas where hazards are more likely to occur, like floodplains. 
Okay, so we've got the hazard itself and how exposed different resources are to that. Then the third part of understanding risk is vulnerability. So when we're thinking about vulnerability in terms of a population, a more vulnerable population will be one that can't move or can't get out of the way of an oncoming hazard. So here's the first of today's speakers, Dr. Jane Strachan, talking about community vulnerability in Kenya. I'm Jane Strachan and I'm the head of International Applied Science. This month, the drought affecting parts of Kenya has been declared a national disaster. They've had below average rains. There's been a failure of both the 2020 short rain season, which happened in October to December last year, and also the 2021 long rains, which occur from March to May. And this has undermined both crop and livestock production in a lot of strong farming communities in Kenya and that has affected food security and income for many households in the region. Jane Strachan. Let's now hear about community vulnerability in another part of the world, Pakistan. Here's Joe Darren from the Asia Regional Resilience to a Changing Climate or ARC program. There's lots of different types of impacts and one of the key areas where climate change is impacting people in the region is from extreme heat. In Pakistan, which gets particularly high temperatures in the pre-monsoon season around May-June time. In June 2015, there was a really severe heat wave. Temperatures reached about 45 degrees Celsius in Karachi in southern Pakistan. And this was estimated to kill about 700 people, primarily from heat stroke and severe dehydration. It's not all about extremes, though. Helen Ticehurst is part of the Met Office International Development Team, and here she talks about the vulnerability of communities which rely on rainwater for agriculture. Climate variability has a really big impact. A lot of people are dependent on rain-fed agriculture for their lives and livelihoods, and they kind of make a lot of decisions according to when the rainy season might start, and it's always been very predictable. It always starts at the same time every year, or has done, up until recently where climate variability is affected when the rainy season starts and how much rain it delivers. So that's having a massive impact on agriculture and crop yields, which has lots of other secondary impacts. Helen Ticehurst. So the first goal of COP26 is to mitigate our emissions or reduce how much carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases we're putting into the atmosphere. Let's hear what Joe Darren had to say about mitigation. The key thing that people are looking for in the COP process is ambition around reducing greenhouse gas emissions. This is really what is driving the warming that we're experiencing and is going to be driving the warming in the future. The science is really clear on this and the latest assessment report from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, shows quite clearly the impacts that will be felt at higher warming levels associated with higher greenhouse gases compared to lower warming levels with lower greenhouse gases. So, if nations can come together, build on and go further than the promises they've already made, then there is a, a chance that we can avoid these worst impacts affecting people in the South Asia region. OK, so Joe mentioned the importance of mitigating emissions, but it's sometimes hard to understand how this will have an impact on people around the world. Here he is talking about how this will affect people in South Asia. There are other risks which are becoming more and more frequent and people are learning to adapt to in new ways. So an example would be tropical cyclones that affect the coastal parts of the region, particularly Bangladesh. And an example is Cyclone Amphan in May 2020. This caused a lot of damage. It was a very strong and intense tropical cyclone, over 13 billion US dollars of, of damage and killed 118 people. Uh, a study by the University of Bristol demonstrated that if Cyclone Amphan was to happen in 2100, with the amount of sea level rise that we're expecting by then, there would be an increase in the exposure, that is the number of people and, and the, the assets exposed to tropical cyclones, of around 60 to 80%. And this is largely because of the increase in sea level rise. So the same storm in a future climate with higher sea levels has potential for much greater impact. And the study also showed that if we follow an emission scenario consistent with the Upper Paris Agreement the climate goal, there was actually very little change in exposure. People are adapting and moving as a result of the changing risks. So that coupled with strong action at COP on mitigation would have a notable and, and real impact on the risks that the region faces. I think that's a really interesting example because sometimes when people talk about keeping warming to 1.5 or 2 degrees C, 
it's really hard to visualize what that means. And for most of us, we can't really imagine how that will affect our lives. But using the example that Joe just gave, the, the people living in South Asia will be less exposed to tropical cyclones at 1.5 degrees C warming than they would be if the warming was higher, say two degrees C or even more. And for me, this adds even more urgency to taking climate action now. So that brings us to the end of goal one, mitigation. We've heard about the importance of reducing our emissions and the impact that that will have on people living in South Asia, where Joe is working as part of an FCDO funded project. Rosie, what's goal two? The second goal of COP26 is adaptation. We've already talked about the importance of reducing emissions, but the climate has already changed and is continuing to change. So people around the world need to prepare for that. Let's hear from Jane Strachan. Whichever mitigation pathway we end up following, so whichever way we end up trying to minimise the amount of carbon that we release into the atmosphere, we are locked into a certain level of climate change that communities will have to respond to. So that means that we'll have to follow a parallel pathway for adaptation. So at the beginning of the podcast, we heard from Jane about how Kenya was affected by a recent drought. We'd like to hear about how communities are adapting to these conditions. So this is all about a country or a community's ability to adapt to the impacts, how much resilience is in the communities to be able to face those changes, those impacts. It might be that we look at options, whether or not they're able to change what type of crops they sow. So they might want to look into climate resilient crop alternatives, for example, or to have insurance systems. That means if the rains fail, then an insurance payment is triggered. But that often isn't there, that resilience isn't there, all those adaptation options aren't there in developing countries. So we want to work with them to understand what adaptation options might be available and how to build resilience. And we also heard from Joe Darren before about the heat waves in Pakistan. He mentioned that temperatures could reach 45 degrees. Now that is really, really hot. And we've seen those kinds of temperatures recently in the US and in Canada. Here in the UK, a heat wave would be something like 35 degrees, even 30 degrees feels warm here. So it's hard to imagine what 45 degrees would feel like or what people would need to do to adapt. And I know that there are places in the world that it's going to become very, very difficult to adapt to this kind of climate change if people are outside. Yeah, and I think in order to adapt, you have to make sure that the right information is available to the public, the people who are dealing with these extreme heat conditions or the drought, like Jane mentioned. This means we have to understand the science behind these changes and have people in the country who can forecast hazards, communicate these to their communities. Let's hear from Jane Strachan again about the importance of science and national Met services in this adaptation role. Resilience includes building capacity in scientific institutions, such as the national meteorological institutions in the country, to forecast what changes might be happening in the future. So, for example, looking at the seasonal forecasts and how that prior information might help people be able to make adaptations in advance of, for example, droughts or heavy rains. So building that scientific capability into the local institutions, for example, is part of that resilience building. So let's move on to the next goal, mobilising finance. As Doug mentioned at the beginning, the global community are looking to raise $100 billion a year to fund the mitigation and adaptation that we've already talked about. But what would this money actually be used for? Helen Ticehurst. We did a project in the Sahal where we were looking at how cash payments to families can be increased in times of drought and flood. And actually we found there that just as an example of the impact that hazards can have on families. So when there's a hazard there, like a drought, often people have to take their children out of school in order that the children can help work to get over that hazard and the family gets into debt. And so they kind of adopt coping strategies to get past that hazard that then trap them in a cycle of poverty, which means by the time the next hazard comes around, they're even less able to cope with that and their resilience is lowered. That's really interesting, Rosie. It's a really moving perspective as a parent thinking about having to take your kids out of school and what that means. I, along with many other parents, had to take my kids out of school for the COVID crisis recently. And it was it was upsetting and it was disruptive. But at the end of the day, we were resilient to that because 
we were lucky enough to have the technology to be able to have lessons and to have input from teachers. And I'm just thinking the impact on us would have been much larger had we not had that resilience and, and effectively that wealth. So I can really see how extra money could help people out of that kind of trap. Yeah, it does feel like a trap. You know, that they're, they're trying to do their best and provide for their family. But then when the crisis hits, they have to take that education away from their children who they're trying not to repeat the same cycle. So um, yeah, I found it yeah, really moving. And it was definitely something that I'd not thought about before, like an extra implication of these hazards. So disaster risk financing is a key area of investment, but the money from the $100 billion that would be raised every year would also be spent on the training of the National Meteorological Services so that they can provide information to the communities that they serve. Let's go back to Helen to hear more. I think they'd like to see recognition of the need for timely and relevant forecasts and climate information being provided by National Met Services, there needs to be increased funding to support Met Services to inform those initiatives with tailored, reliable and accurate and impact-based weather and climate services. So we need to make sure that the people in country are trained to deliver accurate weather and climate information. And that's something that we do here at the Met Office in the UK. So I think the Met Office are leaders in this area and we're in a great position to help with this worldwide. Here's what we're doing in South Asia. We work across a whole range of subjects. An example would be in regional climate modelling, which is the basis for a lot of information on changes in temperature, precipitation. And so we're working with a key partner in the region, ISIMOD, the International Centre for Integrated Mountain Development, to develop and deliver training to the National Meteorological Service organisations in the region so they can develop tailored services, whether that's energy or hydropower, they can provide that information and that understanding. That information can then be used in a range of different applications. So goal three, mobilising finance, is all about getting developed nations to support adaptation and mitigation programmes around the world so that we can reduce the impacts of climate change as a global community. Mitigation, adaptation, finance. Rosie, what's the last goal? The final goal of COP is to work together to deliver. And to me, this is incredibly important. Climate change is a global challenge, and so we should be tackling this from an international perspective. We need to make sure that we have a diverse set of voices in the room so that we can bring everybody together and reach those innovative and equitable solutions. So I think we can credibly claim here at the Met Office that we do a lot of work on this around the world with international partners and we're already leading in this area. International and regional institutions work together to respond to the adaptation and resilience needs. So, for example, one of the projects that we're working on, it's funded by the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office. Um, the partners and the Met Office plus World Bank, but then we're also working with a lot of national institutions, and that could be national meteorological institutions, but also hydrologists. So you can't do this alone. I think that's the message. This has to be done together, both internationally and locally. So that is those local partnerships and those international partnerships that are really going to make a difference here in terms of being able to adapt and build resilience. Okay, so that was a really clear message. We absolutely cannot do this alone. And it sounds like we need to work at different levels. So everything from these big global organizations to national and regional organizations, but also involving local leaders. And there are lots of different partnerships that need to take place in order for that to happen and to get all that weather and climate information to the people who need it to make decisions on the ground. One of the key partners that we work with when we work internationally are humanitarian organisations. Climate service providers um, like National Met Services need to work in partnership with the humanitarian community in order to provide the services that they need. The really key thing is relevant. There's so much information, but unless it's communicated and disseminated in a way that the people who need to use that information can understand and use to take action, then it really doesn't have any value at all. The information only has value when it's used to inform a decision that improves people's resilience.
it's also really important that we have all the key voices in the room to make sure all these different perspectives are considered. One of the key things is that priorities of vulnerable communities and livelihoods that are dependent on the climate need to be in the conversation. It's not just about reducing greenhouse gas emissions, but it's also clearly about adaptation finance and general support to developing and uh, low-income and middle-income countries. Those voices need to be in the decision processes. And in the climate services space, we focus on co-production, bringing people together to come up with solutions. And it's only by including the voices from vulnerable groups, from those who have climate-sensitive livelihoods, in the conversations about how we make decisions around adaptation finance and how that's disseminated, used and applied in different contexts. It's only then that we can make the best decisions and that the people at COP can make sensible policies and targets. So in order to make the most appropriate decisions, we have to include the people who will be impacted by those decisions in those conversations. So it seems pretty logical. It definitely seems simple, uh, which is good. I think that will help us to move forward, but it can also be a challenge. Um, have you worked with anyone internationally as part of your work, Doug? Yeah, actually, I was uh, lucky enough to be involved in a really interesting project which looked at the economy and the climate of the Pacific Northwest, actually. So we partnered with some colleagues in the Pacific Northwest, and then we were looking at the economics of the region, and the economics really, really rely on forestry. It's a huge thing out there in the American West. I was looking at the uncertainty of climate change and feeding that into models of how the climate would change in the future. But one of the really major impacts was something called a pine bark beetle. These are sort of little beetles that live in the bark of pine trees, which are a massive economic product in the Pacific Northwest. And these pine bark beetles come out once in a while and destroy huge amounts of forest, just sort of almost overnight. They're very sort of threshold dependent as well, because actually they're killed by cold winters. Uh, and the worry is that as winters get warmer in the northwest, that there will be no reason for these pine bark beetles not to come out and destroy huge tracts of forest every year. And then any forest which has had a pine bark beetle infestation is more vulnerable to uh, fire as well. So there's all these interesting feedbacks. One of the things that we had to do was to make sure that the people who'd be impacted, the logging companies and the local government, really involved in that project and really understood what was going on. Wow, yeah, that's scary. I guess if you're in forestry, the timescales for that are much longer than if you're growing crops, for example. So you could have been growing those trees for tens of years, all to be destroyed overnight by a beetle. But I don't, can you see them if you go and see the trees? Can you see the beetles? I think you can see there the evidence of them. They kill the trees very quickly and you get these huge bleached almost it looks almost like coral bleaching it's very dramatic looking it can be very quick as well so yeah the, the economics is really sort of dependent on that so that, that was a huge challenge communicating the stuff to the companies communicating with the economists local economists as well was all really important what did you find some of the biggest challenges were uh, were you using the same uh, words to describe things or well, absolutely, uh, Rosie. I think uh, as scientists, we're very used to, to the highly technical language. And a lot of the people that we were talking to were also used to highly technical language, just different highly technical language. So if you get into a room with an economist and uh, a politician, you're all going to be talking, but it might be very, you know, these are smart people, but they're all going to have very different knowledge and understanding. And so finding ways to translate uh, between those people even when everybody's first language is the same, uh, is a real challenge. So to sum up our episode today, the goals of COP are to mitigate, adapt, finance and work together. And I think this episode has highlighted the importance of all of these goals. The Met Office will be working at the forefront of scientific advancement, but also working at the forefront of international partnerships, both during COP week and in the weeks that follow it. My thanks to co-host Dr. Doug McNeil and our guests, Dr. Joe Darren, Helen Ticehurst and Dr. Jane Strachan. This has been Mostly Climate. The producers were Claire Nazir and myself, Rosie Oakes, and the editor is Adrian Holloway. Mostly Climate is a podcast by the UK Met Office.